Under the theme Next Frontiers for Growth, the 15th annual meeting of the new champions took place in Dalian late June with some 1,600 leading figures across the world in attendance, looking at the latest dynamics of the global economic landscape. As Chinese Premier Li Qiang underscored global cooperation and warned against a destructive spiral of decoupling, what is needed to explore new drivers and pathways together to spur global economic growth? On the sideline of the meetings, Wang Guang caught up with Amit Sevak, CEO of Educational Testing Service, also known as ETS, the largest private educational assessment organization in the world. Amit, welcome to Dalian Davos, China. How did you like this session so far? I, I've heard that this is well attended by some 1,700 global participants this time around. Guan, it's such an honor for me to be here. I've been really enjoying uh, getting to experience this summer Davos experience. Uh, Davos in uh, Europe is uh, filled with people from all over the world, but it has definitely a stronger uh, Western uh, country representation. So for me, I like this event because there's so many people from China, from Southeast Asia, from the Middle East, and from many other countries. So it gives you a different feel on some of these global topics. Mm -hmm. uh, did you happen to pay attention to what the Chinese Premier has said uh, during the opening sessions? Uh, anything that uh, impressed you? Any takeaway from his speech? I think a couple of things. I think one is a, a real interest to reinforce uh, the open economy, uh, interdependence, uh, innovation. Uh, in areas like uh, electric vehicles and other areas. So it was interesting for me to hear about some of the areas that are priorities uh, as uh, China, like the rest of the world, emerges from COVID. Uh, so where are the investment opportunities, where are the policy opportunities, and the aspiration to continue to be part of uh, an incredibly integrated uh, global economy. So those are some of the key themes that came out of it for me. And what do you think those opportunities or policy signals will mean for ETS, which is the world's largest private ed education company? For ETS, uh, we're really committed to China. We've been working in China since the 1960s, Guan. So for uh, over 60 years, uh, ETS has had a presence. Uh, we have continued to serve individuals in China who are interested in exploring study abroad, as well as individuals that are looking to strengthen or upskill uh, through a variety of our products and services. So for me, as I look forward, um, I'm growing in confidence about opportunities for ETS to serve some of the key priorities here in China, upskilling uh, in the workforce, uh, managing some of the transition economies, uh, looking at opportunities to uh, support higher education and also youth employment uh, is another key area. So we see a lot of opportunities for us to serve the Chinese economy. ATS is mostly about standardized uh, testing, TOEFL, TOEIC, GRE. But you're saying that you're not just that, you're venturing into other sectors, youth employment, uh, upscaling. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Maybe. Yeah, so at ETS is very proud of our heritage. Uh, we have been a leading provider of educational assessments, primarily for K-12 and higher education. In China, we're most famous for our TOEFL, our test of English or foreign language, uh, and also for the GRE. Uh, these are assessments that we're very proud of. I'm also a uh, having taken the GRE, also a recipient of a GRE score as well. And so I've uh, known and we have known of ETS primarily in the, in the testing space for education. As we move forward, we've formed a point of view that one of the ways that ETS can serve the global economy is by starting to look at opportunities to help with the transition to the future of work. So while we continue to have a strong heritage in education, Guan, we're starting to focus much more on workforce assessment and workforce development. So shifting from a, a, an education only or primary focus to much more development. So what does that mean? Uh, in the last six months, we have acquired three companies. Uh, we acquired a company called PSI uh, with the leadership team based in London that focuses on industry certifications and licensure. So for example, uh, airline pilots, drone operators, uh, individuals in healthcare, in construction, in insurance and finance, uh, helping people get certified and giving them licenses to operate in those industries. So that's one example of a company that we acquired to move ETS from education to increasingly to workforce. We also acquired a company called MTC, Mastery Transcript Consortium, and we're planning on introducing skill-based transcripts. 
So when you graduate from a university, mm. you get a typical transcript mm. that shows what courses you take and mm. what grades you got. We want to now imagine a future in which students that are graduating from high school and universities are also getting a skills transcript. So it's not just what courses you take, but what skills did you learn? Uh, digital skills or skills in collaboration and communication, 21st century work skills. Mm. So we believe that the future is going to become increasingly focused on helping universities and schools prepare for the future of work. So we want to help them with new types of tools like this. So that's a little bit of where we're going uh, moving forward. Do you think the, that the Chinese universities or higher learning institutions are receptive? to these ideas? That's right. First, we want to build some conceptual alignment on what are the needs for the future of the Chinese economy. Because it all, for us, begins with what the job is that we're looking to solve for. And so as we look at some of the emerging economies and emerging industries in China, and we work backwards, we want to partner with universities to help them think about how to, can they prepare students for that. What are the lessons that we learned in other countries, in Europe, in Asia, and how can some of those lessons help? So we're initially starting with thought leadership. We're uh, doing conferences, writing papers, uh, talking with think tanks and other policymakers to understand what are some of the trends in the economy. And then working backwards, we want to then partner with some universities. So many of the uh, institutions we've talked with so far have been very receptive and very open. And so we anticipate uh, identifying institutions that are uh, forward-looking, that want to try some new types of ways to help support uh, the future learners. I mean, you know, for Chinese test takers, they're most concerned, many of them are most concerned about TOEFL and GRE. Mm -hmm. Those are really uh, stepping stones to a, a Western education and a global education uh, for that matter. And we know there's some trends initiated by uh, ETS. I'm not sure if it's targeting the Chinese students, but we highly suspect it. What that mean is, over the years, if you look at the, the reforms of TOEFL, mm -hmm. it was largely a, a rote memorization based testing 20 years ago, perhaps, whereby you can uh, you know, recite all the, 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 the TOEFL vocabulary from the vocabulary pool and you can do relatively okay. And then there was this uh, you know, integration of writing, reading, listening, and uh, what, what is the other one? Speaking. Speaking, yeah. uh, speaking was a new addition to a TOEFL testing. Why did you initiate those uh, changes? Was it you know, more or less based on the Chinese test takers targeting them? And secondly, what is the future trend of your reforms going forward? Great, these are great questions. In our analysis of these types of tests, we ultimately want to understand what are it, higher education institutions looking for. So what are the universities in the United yeah. States, in Canada, in Europe, Australia, because TOEFL is taken uh, and recognized by universities uh, in many countries. When we talk to these institutions, they've increasingly been interested in having students that can, from day one, come in and be ready uh, to go. And so uh, the, the, the shift in focus from primarily writing and reading to much more speaking and listening was because those institutions were really interested in those kinds of four skill uh, competencies coming in. So that was really what shifted that. As we move forward, we've been increasingly interested in thinking about the various ways that we can apply some of the language skills. Uh, so applying them for research purposes or applying them for other types of behavioral activity. We're also imagining a future in which more and more use of AI uh, will become part of our assessments. So looking at different ways that we can use technology to build to deliver and to score the assessments. We're also looking at using AI much more to ensure test security uh, so that when a student is uh, uh, taking the test that they can feel confident, their family can feel confident that there is test integrity uh, in that. So we're, as we move forward uh, looking at those areas, we've also significantly modernized the test. Uh, so actually in April of last year, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity here in China to be able to launch a new and modernized TOEFL. We took the test that was more than three hours long and we condensed it to under two hours. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make this a friendlier test for students and to also make it uh, still have the same psychometric, uh, meaning the statistical rigor, uh, the scientific rigor of the old three hour test. So we're looking for ways to constantly improve the test to make it a good experience still have high quality, high standards, uh, but also use new technologies. If I were a Chinese test taker, you know, I want to ask uh, on behalf of, uh, of you guys, uh, on behalf of them, uh, a question. How uh, can we, uh, as a future test taker, succeed 
mm. in this modernized tofu. What does it take? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the most important way to prepare uh, for a test is to work hard uh, at it, right? And so there, there are all four skills. Um, you're absolutely right that our experiences is that the speaking uh, and listening skills are the areas to increasingly focus on, right? These are the areas because we find that students uh, that um, uh, historically have gotten some preparation in English tend to do better in the reading and the writing areas, but the speaking and listening, the areas that require a little bit more practice, that would be my advice. Uh, really emphasize those areas, really practice those areas. We offer on the TOEFL website uh, a variety of test prep materials uh, to give opportunities to get practice questions uh, to, to work through the process. But uh, as, as they say, um, in education and in life, there's nothing as good as preparation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Preparation, preparation, preparation. That makes sense. So. Um, uh, go going forward for the future, um, any advice for, for the Chinese students when you think about the fact that uh, we're also transitioning mm. um, from you know, an education system that is, uh, that's putting a premium on road learning to an, an increasing number of people realizing the importance of creative thinking and critical thinking. That's right. Yeah, so I think a couple of areas of advice. I think one is the world is changing so rapidly that staying current on economic uh, trends, staying current on what are the kinds of new types of jobs that are coming up. I mean, at this conference here at the Summer Davos, we're hearing a lot about electric vehicles, we're hearing a lot about new energy uh, companies, we're hearing a lot about education and workforce companies like ETS that are looking to modernize. We're hearing a lot about advanced manufacturing, the use of AI in all these different sectors. So one piece of advice is to really familiarize with the different kinds of emerging technologies and emerging job opportunities. The jobs of the past are, are increasingly shifting. Uh, WEF, the World Economic Forum's uh, 2023 study showed that the future of jobs, 40, over 40% 40 of the jobs of today are going to significantly shift by the end of this decade. So in just the next six years, uh, the jobs over the last couple of years are going to fundamentally change. Many of the job titles may be the same, but the actual expectations of what the job is are going to change. More expectations on leveraging AI or different other types of skill sets. So one is understand the jobs of the future. The second is more and more emphasis on human skills. These are skills like communication, collaboration, critical thinking, um, collaborative use of uh, and integration of technologies, digital skills. Um, these kinds of skills are actually going to matter much more. I mean, as, as technology automation, especially AI application happens, a lot of the types of jobs of the past are going to increasingly become automated. Many of the skills will be automated. So human skills are going to matter a lot more creativity, some kinds of applied skills. So these are the kinds of skills I would really double down on. Take time in and outside of the classroom to learn these things, to develop speaking skills, develop ways to apply creativity, artistry, design activities, areas that you can exercise those muscles. I think those are the skill sets of the future, regardless of what area you go into. You're going to see much more emphasis by employers, by people who are hiring on those kinds of communication and other skills. Amit, thank you so much for joining us at this hour. Thank you, Glenn. Very nice to be with you.